maybe 25 years from now, there will be an opportunity for me where I am supposed to step up and, and, and help and, and provide insight for another generation. By not preparing today, I'm failing them 25 years from now. Benjamin Wood, it's just really a pleasure to be able to speak with you today. Uh, I'm, a, I'm here in California, and you are in Virginia. That's right. The state of origin. <laughs> <laughs> Other yeah. presidents. Yeah. For now. We're, not, we're, we're now ashamed of all our statues, so we have to, we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> oh, man, the statues, man. You're losing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I'm in Richmond. We're ground zero for that, so, oh, uh, and have been for a while, but yeah. Man. Lots of iconoclasm. Yeah. It's tough. Um, you know, I'm, I'm emotionally, it's very effective because uh, affecting. I'm trying to figure out what the proper way to relate to the past is and, and how, and also how to relate to the people, to my neighbor today. Um, mm -hmm. And, and try, because I know my own family's past and every, you know, every man in every branch of my family that was alive at the time fought for Virginia in the Civil War. Um, and the overwhelming bulk of them were poor farmers. Um, and I, I know what their motivations were because I have letters from them that I can read. Wow. Um, so it's, it's surreal to see the narrative get so simplified and those lives that I know and am familiar with um, get uh, get turned into a very black and white narrative, but that's what happens every single day um, when we read a newspaper. You know, all the variation in the story gets flattened into mm -hmm. something. So, else. for those that perhaps haven't been reading any of the newspapers, I wonder if you could just describe <laughs> what's happening in in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, well, um, they're just they they've uh, shortly after. Uh, George Floyd was murdered, and I, I think it's pretty clear that was a murder. Um, we had a uh, really just a mob form on Monument Avenue, and they had a confrontation with the police at the police precinct, and then dispersed. And then about a month, it was about a thousand people, and this is my neighborhood, uh, came down the street and just tore everything up. Um, we had vehicles smashed, they burned a bus and vandalized all the statues with mainly with spray paint because these are pretty large things they're not i think the statue of lee is like 12 tons or 19 tons. like they're not going to pull it down with ropes um but they they tagged it with graffiti and um and then they the, the one of the things that was most upsetting to me was they they turned on to a uh, street called Boulevard and actually went to um, the Daughters of the Confederacy, which is like a genealogical society, like the Daughters of the American Revolution or whatever. There is a little bit of a, the South will rise again vibe going on there, but, um, but their headquarter building has libraries with books, um, documents, a lot of things that don't exist anywhere else. There was the, uh, the battle flag of the unit that was under Stonewall Jackson was in there. And somebody threw a Molotov cocktail in there and set it on fire. And so it was just a, it was a very distressing feeling of a sort of Maoist kind of vibe um, hmm. that night. Um, since then, it's calmed down, but we've had demonstrators around the Lee sta statue of Robert E. Lee um, pretty much every day. And uh, there's just, they're kind of camped, not quite like Seattle. Uh, it's not, it's not to that extent, but they're kind of camped out there. And uh, the state, the state government is planning to remove the statue, all the statues on Monument, which have been there for a, about a hundred years. And um, and there's just a lot, there's a lot of ugly history there. You know, there's an argument to be made that those statues were put up as part of kind of what the, the lost cause, which was trying to justify, say that the South was uh, justified in the war and that kind of thing. I don't want to get too in the weeds on that, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been, it's been a a thought provoking week. I feel like part of this is our failure as people here to um, connect with the past and integrate it kind of to rescue the father from the belly of the whale. Um, because there is, there's, a, the, you know, 
they're definitely in the well. I think Jonathan's video about casting down images the other day was excellent mm -hmm. in, in recognizing that there's absolutely sins, you know, the, the, you know, Noah was drunk. Noah was very drunk. Um, and how do we relate to that? And, and, and also how do we relate to people who are around mm -hmm. us today? That's what I'm grappling with. And I, yeah, I I, yeah, he got <laughs> drunk, but then again, he diligently built a salvific ark. Yes, yes, <laughs> for a hundred years or something like that. It's like absolutely. And I was there's man. so many beautiful things around us, um, and I, I see a lot of impulse just to tear it down, and that, mm -hmm. that is upsetting. Anyway, so around here, I come from a small rural place in California, mm -hmm. Northern California. Okay, and. Not a whole lot of demonstrating going on around here. Uh, <laughs> closest would be like Santa Rosa, California, or the okay. Bay Area, San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, but really, like, by and large, like, life as usual out here. And Really? Yeah. So, I mean, like, there's been some issues that are similar out here. Not so much mm -hmm. like the South versus the North or the Civil War sure. and let the South arise or, you know, all the stuff that you just described. It's more so <laughs> with the natives and uh, maybe, like, immigrant communities, like, uh, those from china yeah uh, but really around here we have a very large pomo indian population and so okay. there's there's some uh names and some statues to uh, a gentleman by the name of kelsey and so we have kelseyville mm. we have kelsey creek and he was one of the first settlers here like 150 years ago and we have things named after him we have an obsidian monument that is erected towards his honor. We have a big K that's up on the mountain, or actually more so the oh. volcano, Volcano Canocti, that's uh, overlooking the valley that was called Kelseyville. Wow. And so, I mean, and the ironic thing is that the school, the high school decided to name its mascot the Indians. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the yeah. Kelseyville Indians. And then, so they, so the reason why I bring it up is because my experience, at least locally for the time of my life that I've been here, there was this movement that happened where there was organization, there was diligence, there was patience, and people really advocated to get that name changed, or at least to get the Indians as no longer being the mascot. Right. And they succeeded. And so, mm. but there was lots of meetings, there was lots of advocacy, lots of signatures, lots of com camaraderie and networking to get yep. it done. And they did it. So now it's no longer the Kelseyville Indians. Uh, right. They decided to change it to the Kelseyville Knights, which I, I didn't feel was a, you know, a, a complete clean turn to the other direction, you know, because um, that has its own baggage of its own kind. Sure. It wasn't like, you know, what Stanford changed its name to the, the Cardinal, which is a tree. <laughs> yeah, they're just the tree mascot. Yeah. yeah I, they were just going for the alliteration with the KK, I guess. Yeah. And there's also a movement that did not succeed that was a strong push to change the name from Kelsey ville to kanakdai which mm -hmm. has more of its roots in a, a, a native word or a native sure. name but that one was not successful even though they pushed for it because they said that one was going to be too cost inhibitive because they'd have to change the name of absolutely all the paperwork all the signage all the businesses yeah. would have to change their name and so there was a push back against the movement and as of right now it's still kelseyville and kelsey creek and kelsey so creek brewing company was all that happening with the with the mascot and the town name? Because it wasn't recently. It yeah, sound like. well, I want to say like eight or ten years ago. So, would you attribute maybe um, the, the? It sounds like that is not as bubbling up now, even though everywhere else it is. Mm -hmm. Would you attribute maybe some of the peace now to the fact that it was addressed that way eight years ago? Yeah. So I I bring it up because the way people went about it just seems right. so different today. Yeah. You know, and the research that I've done, the small amount of research that I've done to the civil rights movement, it just seems like it has a totally different tone, a different spirit about it. For sure. That concerns me a lot. Yeah, you know, no, where absolutely. I look at like, a, for example, there's even a graphic novel series, a trilogy by uh, Carl Lewis, Senator Lewis, uh, and a couple other illustrators that partnered with him. Awesome trilogy. It's called March. Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically Lewis was a young leader that was part of the um, movements like the NAACP and the, sure. the 
uh, SCLC and the Freedom Riders and all of those, he was like a major leader, eventually became a senator. And so we wanted to tell those stories in a way that would connect with the youth. So we came up with a graphic novel called March and it's Mm -hmm. awesome. But the thing that just absolutely stood out to me at the time was the fact that these groups practiced and were diligent right. and had ethics and a list of philosophy and a whole code that went about it. And people that went outside that code were like disciplined or kicked out. Yeah. Yes. And so he catalogs this in a graphic novel and like, I mean, they would actually practice like by throwing spaghetti at each other mm, and lunch wow. meals because they're, pre- they're prepping for the sit-ins. Sure. And it just wow. like, just reading these stories, like it just seemed like another way of going about it. And I read that when I was at UC Davis uh, during the time that Milo Yiannopoulos protests were going on and turned violent and were just, uh, as the the leader of the college said, it was the dark spot in the the university's history. Anyway, but like, so there's, and during that movement, there was, um, so the civil rights movement had this incredible level of discipline and patience and which Paul Vanderkley addressed and said that, it, uh, his argument is because a lot of these people were church people and they had these disciplines of what do we do when we get together and practicing and prayer and, you know, reiterating the rituals and doing it over and over again until it becomes fluid and natural. And so they already had it down, yeah. right? They had those muscles worked out. They were ready to go. Mm-hmm. And now we have a modern culture that doesn't seem to be well churched, let's say, or I can, I just in my lifetime, I can say, in the Richmond community, um, Richmond really never had any, we had a very bad violent crime problem in the 90s, which is thankfully, at one point we were worse on murders per capita than Detroit. We were the worst mm. in the country. Wow. So it was, uh, and that dramatically turned around in my lifetime. But, um, so there was violent crime, but we never had uh widespread unrest we didn't have situations like detroit in the 60s or other places like that and when i speak to people who are older than me who have lived here the thing that they all attribute that to i've spoken with uh white folks and black folks on this all of them agree that it was because there was a strong middle class in the black community here in richmond and there was a and they were very churched very and so there was an organization in there where the elders in the community just would, if any of that was starting to bubble up, they just clamped down on it. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and that is why when I've gone, when I grew up, I really didn't feel despite being in the capital of the Confederacy. um, Maybe I was naive, but I went to schools that were, my middle school was a majority black school. My, my high school was probably 50, 50, um, something like that. And um, I never really sensed a great deal of racial tension. And I think in part that was because of those communities um, ha- having faith. Um, mm-hmm. And there was, there was a greater degree of kind of love within the community. Mm-hmm. And I remember the first time I went to the Deep South and actually felt it. And it was a new thing. I said, I was like, what is this? Because I, I didn't really recognize it. Um, and I do think, um, and it's, so it's, that's another thing that's been affecting about this is it's, it seems alien, um, because I've never felt this kind of tension in my city and I don't, and, and, and I, I'm inclined to agree with Mr. Mr. Vanderclyde that, um, the decline in the church probably plays a role in that and allowing, um, anger and, 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 and things to, to manifest more freely and which isn't to say anything about the justifications for anger, mm-hmm. um, but just, you know, I would add also that it's not just faith, but I think of faithfulness, hmm. right. Where mm-hmm. there's like a patience of long yeah. suffering, right. Long suffering where it's like our heels are dug in. We are right. going to love you until we die. Even if you are the ones that kill us, like right. we're not going to play these games. We're not going to overcome evil with evil. Right. Mm-hmm. So all of that is embedded. I mean, most of what I just said was Bible verses. So exactly. Um, I think it carried over well during that time. And I think even 
the reason why I bring up the local issue here with changing the name of Kelseyville, the Canocti, or the mascot from the Indians to uh, Knights. the Knights, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, I want to say something else, but I have to bring myself to say the Knights, um, is because, like, I think, you know, I'm 30, and mm-hmm. I'm, I feel like I'm overlapping generations right about now, where, like, I was alive when, to witness certain movements that were done the old way. Mm. And now there's this new way. Like, of, yeah, there's this new way of doing it that doesn't have the same type of values that I'm used to. And they're uh, unfamiliar to me. The ones of like, we need to get this down, down yesterday. We need to get yeah. these things out of the way. The waiting time is over. And it, the tactics change because the strategy is now built on impatience and a whole lot of other passions, uh, according to my judgment. But yeah. You know, uh, Benjamin, I just, I just thank you for uh, just sharing what it's like to be at the capital of the Confederacy during this time. <laughs> and um, I just, uh, uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what does take place and where this does turn for the good. I hope we can heal. Um, there's a lot of healing that happened. And, and, you know, I have, as a part of the city, I have responsibility for that too. Um, and I, uh, we've all kind of been, shut in our homes for a variety of reasons um, right and then there's that yeah and yes. so it's kind of it's it's weird because you don't know how to engage um but we're gonna have to start engaging and and in, in a and and like you said um I don't, I don't i don't know if the word was heal or love but the the outcome has to move in that direction because this is not sustainable what's happening now I think one of the most powerful things that Peterson said that really hit me deepest was after the channel four controversy. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Mm -hmm. that where, Mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty, pretty heated debate and uh, by all intents and purposes, like Jordan Peterson just came out on top. Sure. But it was that moment where I think I saw him at his best where he didn't rub it in. Like there was a wound there, right? from like an intellectual standpoint or from a verbal standpoint. Like yeah. He yeah. just commanded the argument. Yes. Rhetorically. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Victory. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but, but he didn't let that go to the wrong place or go too yeah. far. And what he said is he said, okay, all of the, the, the comments and all what the media have spun this out to be. He's like, that's not the point. The ultimate goal here and the ultimate victory is peace. Mm. Yeah. And I thought, like, at at first I was like, yeah, this Jordan Peterson guy is okay. But then when I heard him say that, that was the moment where I was like, I look up to this guy. And and he had, um, I would add add to that, within even like on a microcosm level, within the conversation he did that, with that little flip where he said, you know, ha, gotcha. He turned it into, he gave her a a lifeline. really in a moment where she was at her most vulnerable rhetorically, he, he tossed her a life raft, um, which is, was, I thought was a, a powerful display of, you know, kind of kindness and reciprocity, grace, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but then to your point about peace, um, I remember that quote. There's another interview with him. He did with a Dutch guy on YouTube. Um, I remember part of the interview, they were discussing this, you know, the significance of the gladiator movie, the Ridley Scott a gladiator film mm-hmm. but another part of it they were talking about the channel four interview was shortly after and he he he's some people made memes of it he alluded to the fact that you know if he if they they made it sound like he was trying to sick his internet trolls on channel four and and tear the place down and he acknowledged in that interview wouldn't it i could do that i could but he's you know, if in a position where you can access millions of people, I could mobilize them towards violent ends. Um, But I don't, I didn't, let's not do that. So not only did he direct it towards the peaceful end, but he was very conscious of the alternative and also sort of the sadistic appeal of that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, our, our part of our heart is, uh, is maybe is attracted to, Mm -hmm. and then still it wasn't so, that's to, to me that that uh, the the idea of uh, meekness as a, a sheathed sword to be mm-hmm. fully conscious of your capacity for 
or mayhem Mm -hmm. and then choose peace is, uh, yeah, I agree with Mm -hmm. you completely. Yeah. I, I can't say I agree that meekness would probably be the best word for what he's describing, but what he's (laughs) describing is spot on. And to Mm -hmm. see him, uh, it's just amazing that we're commenting on this, you know, like, was it two or three years later? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, But like that moment was so pivotal, right? Like, I mean that in the sense where it's like, here's the point and it could have went this way. It could have went that way, but he chose the right path in that time. And I, I just think now that there's a trajectory, it's worth talking about because that was the point where he was talking a lot about, you know, cultural Marxism and postmodernism and critical theory and what it's doing in all these different domains of society and like warning, 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 like we don't want to go that way. It turns out really violent, you know, wake up. Hello. And, but then he wasn't just preaching it. It was like this moment where he could have just crushed right? Mm -hmm. The rhetorical enemy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. And he stuck to the virtue and he stuck to the right way. I think that goes back to your point about uh, Congressman Lewis and the training. Um, Because it wasn't, you know, in that moment, it wasn't just that he did the right thing in that moment. You know, there were a lot of decisions leading up to that, that trained that muscle to Mm -hmm. be prepared and conscious in the moment of uh, uh, of what was at stake, um, and when when I read when I read Maps of Meaning, and it's been a long time now, uh, or, or a few years, but when I read Maps of Meaning, it feels I, like a long time ago. It does. It? <laughs> I, I mean, it just in terms of what's happened in my life, it's been a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. He, I don't, I, you know, he talks a lot about his uh, his twenties and 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 some of his own life that led him to ask the questions in that book. And I I remember reading it and feeling like this guy chose, he was confronted with something when he was in his 20s. And because of the decisions he made at that age, he put himself in a position to have the knowledge and and, and, um, insight that he did as a 50-year-old man. That Mm -hmm. that then when the Bill C-16 or whatever issue came along, he was ready for that stage. And mm-hmm. channel, channel four is just a, is another thing, uh, uh, another step on that. And then the challenge to me that I take from that, and I tie it back to St. Louis, is if you're not preparing, you know, maybe 25 years from now, there will be an opportunity for me where I am, I, I'm supposed to step up and 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 help and and provide insight for another generation and mm. i by not preparing today i'm failing them 25 years from now mm. you know um and i'm i'm just because of the impact he's had i'm so grateful he made those choices um and uh, i don't want to sound like culty and weird but uh i'm just i am genuinely grateful that you know in alberta 30 years ago this guy was like made the right choice yeah you know? um very grateful so and and he, he catalogs of some of that too because he talks about how he had such like a, an active social life mm-hmm. and you know he had a point where alcohol. he's like i'm gonna have to choose one or the other it's either yeah. alcohol in a social life or <laughs> it's waking up early and staying up late to finish this freaking book called maps of meaning exactly. right and to finish this life's work of research right and it wasn't easy. Those were those were very difficult questions, painful. I can't imagine the volume of like he said he was. I can't remember how long he said he was working on that book, but it was a, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I just to rewind it back to when you were talking about how he had this. Uh, what'd you say, like an internet troll army? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, it makes me think of the stories in the Gospels where Christ does something amazing. Right. And it's those times when Peter usually (laughs) or a handful of people are like, yes, you should be king. Here's your crown. Here's your sword. Let's do this. Right. Right. Let's overthrow the Roman Empire. And he's like, no, no, no. It's not going to be like that. It's not going to be the way you think. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of kingdom. And we're going to play the long game. All right. We're going to play the long game, baby. And we're going to win this thing. And sure enough, 350 some odd years later, they flipped the Roman Empire. Yep. Do you engage and try to replace Caesar 
or do you just render unto Caesar what's Caesar's and, and focus atten attention elsewhere? Um, and that's, that's a different conversation to some extent, but mm -hmm. uh, I do feel like it's related and, and, and that Christ did topple Caesar and, and the church became uh, the, the highest point in the, at least the, the Eastern Roman world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it, they didn't do it by trying to uh, you impose know, force. No, Constantine yeah. was converted by his wife not by and his mother not by um not by an army so oh there's a, man there's some there's a lot to that have so. you heard of the garbage baby story no oh no. man okay so